everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and really inspiring to be at an event where the conversation is not how my AUC or AUPRC is bigger than yours, but rather talking about how these, uh, these AI advances are actually impacting patients and how we can actually make lives better. So I'm going to focus on an example called Chart Watch. I'm going to first start off by uh, telling you a little bit about where I'm from. I'm from Unity Health Toronto, which is a collection of St. Joseph, St. Michael's, and Providence Health in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, I'm going to focus on St. Michael's Hospital for the purpose of this example. We're a level one trauma center. Uh, we're one of two in the greater Toronto area. A tertiary care teaching hospital in downtown Toronto. We care, take care of the sick and the poor. Uh, we're established in 1892. We have about 500 beds, over 6,000 staff, over 900 physicians, over 1,600 nurses. Our approximate annual patient volumes, we have over 75,000, it's about 80,000 or so emergency department visits now, uh, over half a million ambulatory visits a year, and over 25,000 inpatient visits a year. Why am I telling you all this? That's a lot of data. You can imagine if you multiply this by about 15 years of historical data, it's a good amount to work with. Uh, we're, we also have a research institute and we're fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. And the point there is that we have a lot of academic clinicians, very curious people, very um, into innovation. So it's, it's a nice environment and culture. So what have we done at uh, Unity Health? When we look at a lot of centers, uh, they'll say, we do AI. And when we push to say, well, well, what do you do in AI? Well, we have a data scientist. It's not really doing AI. Uh, so what a lot of people will focus on is this research environment, right? So uh, what we've been able to do at Unity is said, you know, we do need that, uh, but that's not where we're going to start. We actually started in the opposite direction. We tried to understand our environment first. So what are the issues that our clinicians are struggling with, our frontline staff, our nurses, our doctors, our physiotherapists, our pharmacists, our administrative decision makers, what do they struggle with? And how do we build an environment that will tackle their problems? So for example, somebody will tell us about a problem that has nothing to do with computer scientists, uh, science. It has everything to do with optimization algorithms with operations research engineering. Why would we hire a computer scientist for that? We should hire an operations research engineer, right? So understanding what the environment is and what the issues are becomes really, really important. We then go and say, all right, well, who are the types of people that we need? But also importantly, what do they need to succeed? And we quickly realized they can't run a lot of their ML algorithms on a, on a hospital server. <laughs> you need much more power. You need much more compute. Um, they're going to need software like Python, PyTorch, R, TensorFlow. Those sorts of things need to be there for these people to succeed. They need servers. Uh, we have a whole Linux-based environment that was foreign to our hospital before we came in. But we need those sorts of things to succeed. So we created an AI environment with data scientists, with uh, the right hardware, the right software, the right environment. But we fully embrace the other side. And the other side is something that a lot of people ignore, is the environment. Our clinicians, our workflows, all that stuff came first, and then came the environment. So we spent uh, about three years actually building our, our infrastructure on the data side that was actually designed and developed for AI that would complement what's needed at the hospital. And we bridged the two. So our rule, I have a team of about 30 data scientists. And one of our general rules is we don't ask the questions. The questions have to come from our clinicians, from our frontline workers, from our end users. They drive the questions. The other thing we require is if you're a clinician or a frontline person or somebody who comes to us, you can raise the question. But if you're the only one who thinks this is a good question, it's probably not a good question. So we have an intake form that you have to fill out, and we need signatures. We need your program director, your medical director, and your division department head to sign off to say, this is, we collectively agree this is an important problem. The other thing we say to them is, you're going to be sitting with us every two weeks, and there's, work going to be in, there's going to be work in between for the next six months or 12 months or however long it takes to develop the solution. You're there every meeting. And in fact, you're leading many of these meetings because you have the clinical insights, we don't. I'm not going to ask my data scientists what they think of this 2T lesion on their head CT, right? Or sorry, on their MRI. They're, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But the clinician does. And their insights really drive how we actually develop our models. So critical that we actually have this environment and this collaborative um, setup. And the engagement from our end users is key. 
So we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've been around for a few years, um, officially about three years now, and we've developed and deployed. Actually, if you go to our hospital now, there's over 40 solutions live in production running. Uh, so quite a few of these actually embedded in our hospital. The one example I'm going to talk about is ChartWatch, how we actually predict clinical outcomes among our patients. This is an actual patient from our hospital um, about four or five years ago, I believe. She's a retired nurse, 73 year old, came in with an inflamed gallbladder, cholecystitis. We see this stuff all the time. It's, it's fairly common. Um, and so, of course, she had a pretty standard diagnostic procedure uh, done. And the plan was to work her up, to manage her, and discharge her home the next day. The physician was called that evening at 6.30 p.m. And uh, the patient had shortness of breath, so the physician ordered chest x-rays and labs. The vital signs were checked twice overnight, midnight at 6 a.m. Unfortunately, the physician was called uh, the next morning at 8.30 a.m. for a sudden drop in blood pressure. The patient uh, decompensated, and unfortunately, she died that day. And the family was distraught. You know, they said, uh, look, we would never have left her bedside because she was suffering. And so our internal medicine team came to us and said, you know, look, here's the issue. Uh, one out of 12 internal medicine patients will die in the hospital. And we asked, what can you do? And they said, well, there's, there's a lot that we could do. Now, some of these patients, about 40, 50% of them, we know they're not going to do well. They're going to die. There's probably nothing we can do about it. But the rest of them, if we had more time, we could have helped. We could have increased monitoring, kept a closer eye on them. We could have looked for signs of sepsis, initiated antibiotics. We could have called the critical care response team and had them on standby, or at least get them familiar with the patient so they know what to expect. We could have called palliative care. If we knew this patient was going to die, at least they would die a comfortable, dignified death. We could have communicated to the family. We could have done all of this so much earlier and possibly prevented that person from dying. So their ask was, all right, guys, you got this team. You got this infrastructure. Can you predict who's going to die or go to the ICU at least 24 hours, 48 hours in advance? And of course, we said, you know, why don't we look at what other people have done? Because this doesn't have to be new. And we looked around. You know, there's a national warning system in the UK. I think 70 or 80% of hospitals in the UK have deployed it. It's very cumbersome, mechanical, and the performance isn't that great. Same thing with other systems that were out there. We just, it wouldn't work with our clinicians. So, uh, and there's also studies that are actually highlighting problems with a lot of these solutions out there. While we'd have, we would have loved to have taken something in, it just wouldn't have worked for us. In fact, if we look at, as an example, the National Learning Warning Score, um, we actually have clinician predictions. So we actually spent time on our floors asking our doctors, nurses, and our residents, do you think this patient's gonna die or go to the ICU in the next 24 to 48 hours? And uh, our clinicians beat news, right? So why would we deploy a system like that? Our clinicians are better. And when people tell me, and this is one of the things I'll, I'll comment on a little bit later, I'm going to use accuracy as an example. My algorithm's accuracy, for very simplistic argument, is 96%. And I would say that is awful because our clinician's accuracy is 98%. But if you tell me for another clinical scenario, my accuracy is 74%, I'll say, that's fantastic, because our clinician's accuracy is 62%. So it's all relative in terms of how useful that algorithm is going to be, right? So we developed this algorithm. If you're a patient at St. Michael's Hospital, our general internal medicine unit uh, has this fully deployed. It's been there for about two years now. Uh, we're now deploying in other units and expanding to uh, St. Joseph's Hospital as well. Um, what this algorithm does is it grabs data every hour on the hour. And we've trained it on about 20,000 patients worth of data. Um, so it grabs typically over 100 variables. And what it will do is it will predict in the next 48 hours if this patient is going to die or go to the ICU. And it categorizes patients as low, medium, and high risk. As soon as it reaches a high risk threshold, it is automated to page the medical team. And our protocol is a medical team has to go and see that patient within the two hours of being paged. And there are clinical care pathways that then they look at to assess what they do with the patient next. So we launched this thing in October of 2020. It's been a little over two years. And uh, within a few weeks, we had these kind of nice emails coming out from our attending physicians. Uh, one of them is the resident on call overnight received a high risk alert around 11 p.m. She went and reviewed the client, uh, sorry, the chart and saw the patient as per the recommended protocol. 
he was relatively stable, so maybe the algorithm didn't get it right. Approximately two hours later, she received a call from the nurse that the patient was decompensating. As she already knew the patient, she was able to quickly assess her the bedside and get the ICU team involved. The patient went to the ICU but did not, thankfully, have a respiratory arrest, which was certainly a risk if the intervention had not been done as quickly. The resident feels the AI program made a big impact. Comments are great. <laughs> what about mortality numbers, right? So prior to deployment, these are our mortality rates. And we deployed, uh, we were looking at when to deploy, and we were going to hold off because of the pandemic and there was so much going on, but our patients were dying. Our mortality rates increased significantly um, during the pandemic. So if we look at um, January to March, this is the time frame where we first started seeing our COVID cases. If we compare that interval to the four years prior, uh, we saw a 35% increase in mortality among our high-risk patients. Uh, if we look at April to June, uh, we had more COVID patients, a 70% increase in mortality. Now, July to September, uh, you know, it, things got better. We didn't have as many patients. It was a good summer, but we still saw a 37% increase in mortality. This is when we deployed ChartWatch, and we saw a drop in mortality despite, despite many more COVID patients in our hospital. So it's really encouraging to see that at least our preliminary data are suggesting that these things actually can save lives. And the clinician response was fantastic. Um, that's the other validation that we have, is the clinicians don't complain, it, it's a good sign. Now, what are some learnings? When a, po a lot of people talk about, all right, well, what did you use? Did you use an XG boost or an ensemble model with the complex voting mechanism? That's, that's not that important. What's really important is the data engineering and the machine learning operations that very few people talk about. Because it's not really sexy or attractive, but it's all that engineering and all that work to make sure the pipelines don't fail that you've got a good flow, that uh, let's say you're, we've deployed now, how does the feedback loop issue come in now because now we're intervening and we, we, we will experience data shifts. We had one issue where we changed the reagent for our troponin tests. That throws things off considerably. How do we know all of this and how do we correct for these things? It's all that engineering, all that operations that become critical to this. Performance metrics and evaluation, like I'd mentioned, it's not all about the AUC. Physicians will tell you quite often, it's about alarm fatigue for a lot of us, right? If you have too many, as uh, was mentioned in the previous presentation, if you have too many false positives, we're just gonna ignore this thing. So if we looked at news and a lot of the other systems that I had, I'd mentioned, those systems, uh, the not so great ones, will do 15 to 20 alarms a day. The uh, half decent ones will do 10 to 15 alarms a day. Chartwatch does one to two, right? One to two. Because if you do too much and you get it wrong most of the time, it's, it's a very useless tool. And the physicians will actually be annoyed, so will the nurses. Um, all sorts of other considerations around clinical validation. You have to be able to, to gain confidence and trust of people who use it. Because while we focus on algorithms, it's a lot more about people feeling comfortable and trusting the algorithm. And so how do you build trust? You show them that it's actually going to help you, not hurt you. In fact, it's going to outperform you in a very respectful way if you work with it. And that builds a lot of trust and comfort. Privacy and confidentiality, you can imagine uh, people wondering, well, who are these data scientists actually having access to identifiable information? Because we talk a lot about research and de-identified data. That is utterly useless because if I have to show that Mr. Jones is going to die, in the next 48 hours, I need to know it's Mr. Jones. But of course, all sorts of privacy and, uh, and governance considerations there. Risk and liability, you can imagine uh, saying, okay, so this algorithm is gonna go off and clinician, you're responsible in the next two hours to see this person. And the clinician says, okay, but what if I don't agree with the algorithm and the patient dies? Does somebody get sued? So of course, lawyers have to get involved. We have to have a process around this and make sure that everyone's covered from a risk and liability perspective. And of course, bias and equity, right? We're able to show that our algorithm performs uh, just as well among young people versus old people, among males versus females. We don't have data on gender, so we don't know. Um, on sick and not so sick, we don't have data on race. We don't know. But does that mean you don't deploy? I don't think so. Uh, because a lot of people will fuss and say it's unethical if you deploy without knowing if it works just as well in certain races and others. And my response typically is, we can remove the algorithm and those people can die while we figure that out. Is that okay? Um, the typical response is, no, I, I think it's probably good to have that algorithm up. And of course, we'll explore these once we have the data. 
We published a few papers based on our experience. Uh, there's a series in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that we published, uh, I think, last year. Um, there's a three-part series, so if people are interested, I'd be happy to refer you to those. Uh, that is, so it's a bit more Canadian-centric. And the last thing I'll say is our model has been uh, evolving over time. Uh, the first thing that we focused on is building that AI lab, right? This is what a lot of research groups uh, go towards. But we've coupled it with the living lab. And the living lab has really forced us to think beyond the servers and the ML algorithms to the data pipelines, the engineering, the machine learning operations, and very importantly, data governance. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with hospitals and their data government, governance is virtually non-existent that does not enable these sorts of, uh, of solutions. So having proper data governance that is progressive, that is forward thinking, that enables AI, critical. We spent a year and a half with uh, a legal team developing our data governance uh, uh, approach. And of course, the last thing is the AI accelerator. There's no way we're going to be able to deploy these things in other hospitals. A public health care organization cannot do this. So we've learned the hard way, unfortunately, over a few years that it is really tough to deploy outside our own four walls. So what we've done is we've turned to the private sector. So in April, we launched Signal One, uh, which is a collaboration between a startup and Unity Health. Uh, we want to see more of these because we believe the private sector is really going to be driving deployment outside of the public sector, uh, the individual public sector organization. And we're very excited to see how that partnership can evolve to bring these sorts of solutions to everyone in the world so that we can have better care for all of us. Thank you.